again is bad luck. Now the beginning of this journey was full of bad luck, which should have been an omen to turn back. As it was pulling out of the harbor, the ship almost collided with the SS New York. Earlier, during the construction in Belfast, fire had broken out in the coal bunkers. Those are just a few of the bad omens surrounding the ship before it struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic and sank and sank, according to the Titanic disaster, omens, mysteries, and misfortunes of the Doom Liner, Frontline Books, by British author James Bancroft his second book about the tragic crossing. The RMS Titanic was the world's largest and most luxurious vessel at the time, a veritable floating palace valued at $7.5 million in 1912. But according to Bancroft, a sense of gloom hung over her. Rumored aboard was the cursed Egyptian mummy's coffin lid, and there are strange events concerning the RMS Titanic than any other ship in history, and the feelings of foreboding and bad omens associated with it suggest the fate had it doomed to a a watery grave, writes the author. The iceberg was just the weapon that sent it there. Number 9. Cancelled Emergency Drill On April 14th, the day the Titanic struck the iceberg, an emergency lifeboat drill had, ironically, been scheduled. Now, due to reasons unknown, the drill was cancelled by Captain Smith. If the drill had gone through, many more lives could have been saved. The passengers would have been more likely to follow proper protocol and procedure in loading the lifeboats. You see, a little more than an hour after contact with the iceberg, a largely disorganized evacuation began with lowering the first lifeboat. The craft was designed to hold 65 people, and it left with only 28 aboard. Tragically, this was to be the norm, as during the confusion and chaos during the precious hours before Titanic plunged into the sea, nearly every lifeboat would be launched underfilled, some with only a handful of passengers. Now, in compliance with the law of the sea, women and children boarded the boats first. Only when there were no women or children nearby were men permitted to board. Yet many of the victims were in fact women and children, the result of disorderly procedures that failed to get them to the boats in the first place. If they had done that drill, it could have saved many more lives. Number eight. Construction. The Olympic class ships featured a double bottom and 15 watertight bulkhead compartments equipped with electric watertight doors that could be operated individually or simultaneously by a switch on the bridge. It was these watertight bulkheads that inspired Shipbuilder magazine in a special issue devoted to the Olympic liners to deem them practically unsinkable. But the watertight compartment design contained a flaw that was a critical factor in Titanic sinking. While the individual bulkheads were indeed watertight, the wall separating the bulkheads extended only a few feet above the water line, so water could pour from one compartment into another, especially if the ship began to list or pitch forward. Now, the second critical safety lapse that contributed to the loss of so many lives was the inadequate number of lifeboats carried on Titanic. A mere 16 boats plus four collapsibles could accommodate just 1,178 people. Now, the Titanic could carry up to 2,435 passengers and a crew of approximately 900 brought her capacity to more than 3,000 people. As a result, even if the lifeboats were loaded to full capacity during an emergency evacuation, there were only available seats for only one-third of those on board. With all these issues, it's no shock that the tragedy had happened. Number 7. Violet Jessup was on board because Violet Jessup was on board, to me, it seems like the ship was doomed. Now, if you don't know who she is, let me introduce her to you. In 1911, she began working as a stewardess for the White Star Line's RMS Olympic. Violet was on board on September 20th, 1911, when Olympic left from Southampton and collided with the British warship HMS Hawk. Now, despite damage, the ship was able to make it back to port without sinking. She then continued to work on Olympic until April 1912, when she was transferred to the sister ship, the Titanic. Titanic. Violet boarded the RMS Titanic as a stewardess on April 10, 1912. Four days later, on April 14th, it struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic and sank about two hours and 40 minutes after the collision. She was later ordered into lifeboat 16, and as the boat was being lowered, one of Titanic's officers gave her a baby to look after. Now, the next morning, Violet and the rest of the survivors were rescued by the RMS Carpathia and taken to New York City on April 18th. Then, in the First World War, Violet was a stewardess on the British 
British Red Cross, and on the morning of November 21st, 1916, she was aboard HMHS Britannic, the younger sister ship of the Olympic and Titanic that had been converted into a hospital ship, when it sank in the Aragon Sea after an unexplained explosion. It seems like no matter what ship she was on, it sank. Number six, they were told about the iceberg. Yep, you heard that right, folks. By 7.30 p.m., the Titanic had received five warnings by nearby ships. Marconi wireless operator Jack Phillips took down a detailed ship's message, pinpointing the location of heavy packs of ice and a great number of bergs, but Phillips, busy sending passengers personal messages, apparently did not show it to any officer. At 10.55 p.m., another ship, the Californian, radioed to say it had come to a full stop amid dense field ice. Now, neither those messages began with the crucial code that would have required Phillips to show it to Captain Smith, and Phillips was not in the mood for interruptions. Now, the Californian's electric signal was so close it nearly deafened Phillips. Shut up, shut up, he radioed back. I am busy. Now, a while later, the Californian's radio operator shut down for the night. As the Titanic surged onward, lookouts Frederick Flea and Reginald Lee peered into the darkness. Just before 11.40, Fleet noticed something blacker than the sea lying directly ahead. As the ship drew closer, recognition dawned. He rang a warning bell three times and phoned the bridge. What did you see? Came a voice through the receiver. Iceberg right ahead, replied Fleet. Now it's crazy that they had all these warnings and still nothing was done about it. Number five, the Titanic wasn't the Titanic. Okay, so this is a conspiracy theory, but I feel like it has to be mentioned. One of the controversial and elaborate theories surrounding the sinking of the Titanic was made by Robin Gardner in his book Titanic, The Ship That Never Sank, 1998. Gardner draws on several events and coincidences that occurred in the months, days, and hours leading up to the sinking of the Titanic, and concludes that the ship that sank was in fact Titanic's sister ship, Olympic, disguised as Titanic as an insurance scam by its owners. The International Mercantile Marine Group, controlled by American financer J.P. Morgan, had acquired the White Star Line in 1902. Would they have really put all those people's lives at risk on purpose? I don't know, but it's definitely something worth thinking about. Number four, no binoculars. Now, one of the most useful pieces of equipment, the binoculars were nowhere in sight no pun intended, when the Titanic left on its voyage. Binoculars that could have been used by lookouts on the night of the collision were locked up aboard the ship, and the key was held by David Blair, an officer who was bumped from the crew before the ship's departure from Southampton. Some historians have speculated that the fatal iceberg may have been spotted earlier if the binoculars were in use, but others say it wouldn't have made a difference. Regardless, binoculars would have been a good thing to have on board, and it seems like they sabotaged themselves by not having any. Also, my question is, why were they locked up away somewhere that you needed a key to get it out? It just doesn't make any sense. Number three, the fire. In Titanic, the new evidence, Irish journalist Shannon Manoli argues that the hull of the infamous ship weeks before it set sail. Through researching photos and eyewitness testimony from the time, Maloney contends that a fire spontaneously lit inside one of the Titanic's enormous coral bunkers critically weakened a crucial segment of the ship's hull. In a discovery of a trove of photographs documenting the ship's construction and preparations for its maiden voyage. Now, as he poured over the images, Maloney was shocked to see a 30-foot long black streak documented on the outside of the Titanic's hull, close to where the iceberg struck its starboard side. According to engineers from the Imperial College London, the streak in the photograph may have been caused by a fire in one of the Titanic's coal bunkers, a three-story tall room that stored much of the coal that fueled the ship's engines. Maloney believes that the fire had started as early as three weeks before the Titanic set out for its maiden voyage, but was ignored for fear of bad press and the desire to keep the ship on schedule. Then the fire caused damage, which made them hitting the iceberg a fatal mistake. Number two, last minute cancellations. As the Titanic was prepared to sail, some 50 booked passengers had such strong forebodings that they refused to board at the last minute, willing to lose the high cost of passage. Yep, all of a sudden they just went, eh, nah. 
Now, absent was financer JP Morgan, whose International Mercantile Marine Shipping Trust controlled the White Star Line, and who had selected Ismay as a company officer. Morgan had planned to join his associates on the Titanic, but canceled at the last minute when some business matters delayed him, or did he know that the ship was going to sink? Now, other prominent passengers that decided not to board were former United States Secretary of State Robert Bacon, Alfred Gwen Wilderbitz, and Candy Tycoon, Milton Snavely Hershey, and his wife Catherine. Now, did they have some sort of insider information? I don't know, but it's strange. And coming in at number one is The Wreck of the Titan. In 1898, author Morgan Robertson wrote The Wreck of the Titan. It seemed to very accurately predict what was going to happen to the Titanic. Robertson had written about a ship, the Titan, going on its maiden voyage across the Atlantic that struck an iceberg and sank. The liner did not have enough lifeboats, and it was described as being unsinkable, seeing as it was one of the biggest ships of its day. Now, doesn't that sound all too familiar? And the story was written 14 years before the sinking of the Titanic. Many wondered if Robson was a precent writer, but others said he just knew what he was talking about since he wrote mainly about maritime affairs. Now, perhaps he saw ocean liners becoming bigger and bigger and wondered about the dangers of this, including icebergs. He was approached and asked, if he was clairvoyant after the sinking of the Titanic. No, he replied, I know what I'm writing about, that's all, but I'm not too sure about that. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Reddit story. This story comes from Reddit user NextGuitar2992, and they were replying to a post asking if anybody remembers being on the Titanic in a past life. They replied with, quote, Maybe? I'm one who's on the fence about past lives and such, but I don't know about this. I'm obsessed with the Titanic, and I asked my mom as a joke if I maybe reincarnated from it, and she said without hesitation, yes you are. Which got me thinking. I knew about the Titanic before I could even speak. She says that even as a one year old, I was drawing the ship as best as I could, and drawn to the ship. The first time I saw A Night to Remember and the Titanic 1997, the sinking scenes just felt off. Even the Breakup in the 97 movie, I said, that's not right. Mind you, I was around four to six when I saw it, and I was right. The sinking scenes in both movies are said to be inaccurate. I've always known the fourth funnel was for decoration when no one else around me knew. I've always had an obsession with the second class areas. I've always hated water, literally for no reason. I just hate it and I don't know why. Same goes for cold. I can't handle anything under 45 degrees or I'll have a panic attack. Again, I don't know why, it just happens. I've always been looking up facts and such about the Titanic and when I look up the lost ladies, I had a major anxiety attack. Never happened before when I was reading things about other survivors and victims. And lastly, I've always had an obsession with the Titanic and its stories, and I still do. Could just be coincidence, but sometimes I wonder. In our number nine spot today, we have Jessica Brooks. Jessica is an accomplished violinist with a profound connection to a tragic chapter in maritime history because she firmly believes that she had a past life on the Titanic, not as a passenger, but as a member of the ship's orchestra, playing music that echoed through the grand halls of the doomed vessel. Her claim is supported by an uncanny and detailed knowledge of the Titanic's musical repertoire, despite having never studied it in her current life. Even more compelling is her unusual affinity towards the hymn, Nearer My God to Thee. This hymn is notably significant as it's widely spread to have been the last song played by the Titanic's band as the ship succumbed to the icy waters of the North Atlantic. This strong emotional connection to the him and her vivid past life memories make Brooke's case exceptionally compelling. In our number 8 spot today we have Lucinda Green. Lucinda is a woman with an uncanny and heart wrenching connection to the Titanic. Green's ties to the ship trace back to her childhood when, long before she learned about the ill fated vessel, she would draw detailed images of a large ship colliding with an iceberg. This peculiar fixation turned out to be the tip of the iceberg of her mysterious link to the Titanic. As Green grew older, she began to express detailed memories of a past life. She insisted that she had been Mary, a nanny aboard the Titanic tasked with the care of two young children. Her recollections were far from rosy nostalgia. She described the deafening chaos of the ship sinking, the shrieks of metal, the panicked cries of passengers, the chilling sound of wailing. Most distressingly, she remembers being helplessly separated from her charges amidst the confusion, a memory that brought her great distress. What makes Green's story 
story all the more captivating is its corroboration by historical facts. Records from the Titanic reveal that there was indeed a nanny named Mary aboard the ship who tragically lost those under her care. This astonishing alignment between Green's memories and documented history lends considerable weight to her claims. In our number 7 spot today we have the birthday connection. This past life story comes from a reddit user called lowstick6746 and they wrote about how their initial Titanic connection comes from the fact that their birthday falls on April 18th, the day when the Titanic survivors reached New York. However, her connection to the ill-fated ship remains elusive, confined to dreams of witnessing its construction and fleeting glimpses of elegant, well-dressed individuals from a distance. These encounters evoke a sense of observing a higher social class without being a part of it, leaving her with a feeling of detachment. A cruise she embarked on shortly after the release of the Titanic film proved to be an eventful journey. Amidst the challenges of rough seas, a peculiar incident occurred. One evening after dinner, she strolled along an exterior promenade and a distinct familiarity overcame her. The chilly air, the sound of her shoes on the deck, everything seemed eerily recognizable. Looking down, she caught a glimpse of her shoes and the wet decking, triggering a sense of deja vu. Her mind connected the dots, recalling that her shoes were once black, much like her dress in that dream. It was an odd realization since she had never owned a black dress in her waking life. Despite her strong affinity for the Titanic, she lacks any fascination or interest in other ships, leading her to question the extent of her involvement. In our number 6 spot today we have William Barnes. In his early childhood, William Barnes exhibited signs that hinted at a connection to the ill-fated Titanic in a past life. At the tender age of 4, he astounded his parents by drawing a ship with four smokestacks and declaring, this is my ship, but she died. Curiously, he insisted on being called Tommy and spoke of siblings, aunts, uncles, and brothers who were unknown to his parents, as well as troubling nightmares that plagued his sleep. Years later, at the age of 25, having relocated to Washington, D.C., William sought the guidance of a counselor proficient in hypnosis. During one session, he engaged in a fervent debate about the ship's design while under a trance, and upon emerging, he declared with certainty, my name is Tommy Andrews. This marked the first time that he had uttered the complete name. At 38, after embarking on a new marriage and moving to Arizona, William startled his wife, Marianne, during a restless night's sleep, passionately arguing and uttering unfamiliar names with a very distinct accent. Ultimately, these strange occurrences affected his life so much, and finally, in 1997, he was referred to Dr. Frank Baranowski, a psychologist renowned for employing hypnotic age regression to aid individuals in overcoming phobias. Initially skeptical, William approached the regression sessions with doubt, convinced that they would be futile. However, to his astonishment, the therapy proved effective for him. The sessions were meticulously recorded and later released, and in the recordings, listeners can hear William speaking as Tommy Andrews with his distinctive Irish accent, recounting the harrowing events of the Titanic sinking and reliving his own tragic demise on the ship's deck. In our number 5 spot today, we have Bess Waldo Daniels. This story comes from someone who uses the online username Bessie A, and they wrote about how they firmly believe that their past life was intertwined with the tragic tale of the Titanic. Recounting their memories as Bess Waldo Daniels, the validation of their past existence as Bess stems from an intriguing discovery. Photographs of her husband and children bear an uncanny resemblance to the images that once flashed through their mind. They have distinct memories from this life that go all the way back to childhood childhood, memories of their sister, their parents, and even later memories as well, ones that include their past life husband, HUD. Curiously, their memories skip the moments of meeting and marrying Hudson. Instead, they recall the births of both their children, Helen and Hutsey. While their memories encompass the Titanic, they admit gaps concerning the journey from Canada to England and their activities in England. Their recollections resume within their stateroom, basking in the sunlight streaming through the porthole. On the night of the sinking, Hudson briefly disappears, but upon his return, he leads everyone to the boat deck, cautioning against using the elevators and urging the stairs instead. Though their memories fail to bridge the gap between reaching the boat deck and the subsequent events, a serene atmosphere pervades their recollection. People converse calmly in groups, interrupted only by the arrival of a tall man with a brown beard, whose words escape their memory, but stir a feeling of discomfort within them. Turning their attention to Hudson, they observe a profound change in his 
his demeanor, as if life itself drains from his being. Suddenly, they find themselves in a boat surrounded by fearful and anxious individuals. A scared looking woman with distinct cheekbones sits next to them, while another refined lady, very English, occupies a nearby seat. Amid the chaotic scene, they cry out but cannot recall their exact words. Waiting at a nearby boat, two officers, identifiable by their uniforms and hats, accompany them, but suddenly, as if the ship vanishes beneath their feet, the man loses grip and they descend into the ocean depths. The original post explains that they had to cut out so many of the details that they can remember, and I also had to cut out details that they did include for the sake of this video, so it's very clear that this person has a ton of memories of this past life. In our number 4 spot today we have the Grand Staircase. This post came from the Reddit user called Vish Trinity, and they titled their post, I am sure I died in the Titanic. They continued on to write, I was 6 when my mother told me about a ship named the Titanic that sank in 1912, and that's when I started getting dreams where I could see the vast deck, the ballroom, the famous Grand Staircase. I would also get dreams about floating in the ice cold water, seeing the huge ship break in two, and a lot of things. This was a year before the movie came out. Also, let me tell you, my mother never told me how the ship sank or about the interiors of the ship, as in the ballroom, deck, etc. When the movie came out, it was like deja vu for me. All the scenes felt like I had been there and experienced it before. So I'm sure I was on the Titanic and died in the ice cold water on that fateful night in a past incarnation. In our number three spot today, we have the Titanic memory. This story comes from Reddit user Commodore Comac, and they wrote in the past lives thread, and they said, quote, I I appreciate the fact that there are many, many more people who claim to have been on the Titanic in a past life than could have possibly been on the ship, but when I was 11 years old, I had the clearest dream that I have ever had, and that includes the subsequent three decades of my life. I'm standing on the deck of the ship, I'm in a heavy fur coat, and my gloved hands are holding on to a wooden rail. Overhead is a night sky filled with stars, but no moon. Four funnels stretch above me. There is the sizzle of white rockets racing towards the stars. The ship is sinking by the bow. There is darkness and water. I die. A year later, I read the book A Night to Remember. Then I learned about the sinking of the Titanic, a ship with four funnels. Sank by the bow on a clear night. Fired distress rockets. Not enough lifeboats. Logical explanation? Easy. Overheard a story. Saw something on the television. Happened to have a dream about a ship and just happened to get some facts right. But it didn't feel like a dream then, and it still doesn't. In our number 2 spot today, we have Mark Robert Hopkins. This person posted online with their story, and they wrote, quote, They're not as much memories as familiar sensations, really. The distant sound of violin music playing, the feeling of plush carpet beneath me, the flickering of wall sconces, the cramped feeling of slowly working my way up a stairwell with many others, a slanting deck, a vast black wall of metal rising up along one side, the biting cold air, the sound of metal grinding and booming sound sounds popping in the darkness, the feeling of aloneness and desperation of being isolated in a lifeboat in a vast body of water at night miles from anywhere. It all seems so familiar, and this was even before I began learning about the Titanic. As a matter of fact, the curiosity behind it drew me into the Titanic. As for who? Definitely not someone important. Somehow the identity of a 10, 12, or 14 year old boy stands out to me. First or second class with the last name O something, as in O'Brien, for example, although I don't remember there having been any O'Briens in first or second class. The sensations are vivid, not cohesive. It's like they're latent or submerged in trying to put themselves together and come to the surface, like pieces of very old memories. Others I know are supportive of this and agree with the possibility that I. I just may have been on the Titanic. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have Robert Ballard. Renowned oceanographer Robert Ballard carved a unique place for himself in history when he discovered the wreckage of the ill fated RMS Titanic in 1985. But the intriguing aspect of Ballard's connection to the Titanic extends beyond his historical discovery. Throughout his life, Ballard was fueled by a deep, inexplicable connection to the Titanic, an uncanny bond that was pivotal in his relentless pursuit of the ship's final resting place. Some paranormal researchers have 
contemplated on the nature of this very extraordinary connection. They posit that Ballard may have had a past life association with the Titanic, suggesting that his intense drive to find the ship was more than a mere professional ambition or a personal obsession. Could it be that he was subconsciously attempting to unravel the threads of his own past, a past that was tragically intertwined with the Titanic's ill-fated voyage? Starting us off at number 10, we have the final resting place. When it comes to Titanic related hauntings, it should come as no big surprise that the actual site where the tragedy occurred is considered one of the most haunted spots of all. According to those who have visited since the fateful day, strange sights such as odd glowing orbs of light can be seen floating around at night, and many believe they are actually the spirits of those who died at sea. But that's not all. Deep sea vessels that have explored the area near the sinking have reported to receive eerie, faint SOS calls that fade in and out, and seem to have no traceable source. Could they be the ghosts of the fallen crying out for help? Many definitely believe so. Now, orbs of light and radio static are nowhere near unheard of when it comes to suspected paranormal activity, especially when you're dealing with a place such as this, where so many people have perished. However, the most terrifying curse of all has to do with an old legend that says if you aren't careful, the lonely ghosts in the sea may just pull you overboard to live the rest of eternity with them. So just be safe if you are sailing in the area. Coming in at number 9, Titanic's Builder. Inside the Titanic exhibit in the Luxor Hotel is a portrait of a man named J. Bruce Ismay, who was one of the builders of the Titanic many years ago. However, the thing about Ismay was that he's not really what you would describe as a hero. Apparently, he fled the sinking ship, leaving women and their families behind, and witnesses on the lifeboats claim he kept his back to the ship as it descended. But worst of all, it said he was the one insisting the ship speed up after receiving ice warnings. And as a result, it's believed he is not terribly liked by the ghosts who did not survive the disaster. In fact, one morning in particular, as the crew came in to open the exhibit, they found the portrait portrait of Ismay on the floor. When the manager watched the surveillance video from the night before, he was stunned to see the picture began shaking before coming off of the wall seemingly all by itself. Many believe that those who perished that night haunt the exhibit, tearing down his photo, and some believe that if you aren't careful, they may just curse you for being associated with him. Coming in at number 8, No Pope. So this next one is kind of a full conspiracy, but you know what? I just couldn't help myself. Apparently one of the myths that supports the idea that the ship was cursed comes from the ship's number. The number in question was allegedly 390904, but some Catholic employees who built the ship were distressed at the time as the number, when viewed in a mirror, appears to say no pope. Apparently this meant that the ship was cursed and godless in their eyes, and that coupled with someone allegedly saying that God could not sink the ship made for one giant cursed vessel. To be honest, I'm not sure how much of this myth is based in fact and how much of it is a glorified legend, but I'm not out to tempt fate in the same way the Titanic did all those years ago. Coming in at number 7, Ghost of the Titanic. One can assume that there are as many ghosts as there were fatalities associated with the infamous sinking of the ship, but one of the most famous is thought to be that of Frederick Fleet. Frederick was a British sailor serving as the lookout aboard the RMS Titanic, and it was Frederick who actually spotted the deadly iceberg and warned the bridge. But tragically, as we know, his warning came too late and the ship was not able to avoid the disastrous collision. However, the saddest part was that although Fleet survived the sinking of the Titanic, he suffered deeply from depression in part to his survivor's guilt, and tragically his depression only grew worse over time. Finally, after his wife's passing just after Christmas in 1964, and the shortly followed eviction from his brother-in-law, Frederick took his own life. Following his death, he was buried, but strangely his grave remained unmarked until the Titanic Historical Society erected a headstone for him in 1993. 
These days, however, it appears his spirit is not quite at rest, as witnesses have claimed to see him keeping watch over the Las Vegas exhibition's promenade deck, perhaps driven by his guilt to watch even in the afterlife. Next up at number 6, a ghost on board. Back in 1977, second officer Leonard Bishop of the SS Winter Haven gave a tour of the ship to a man who he naturally assumed was a passenger. Apparently the man was British and very soft spoken, but extremely interested in every detail of the vessel, almost unusually so. Bishop found the man to be a bit strange, but didn't think much of it, and continued to tour him around. But it wasn't until a few years later when he saw a photo of Titanic Captain Edward John Smith that Officer Bishop realized why the situation felt so off. Allegedly, he exclaimed to a friend, I know him, I gave him a tour of my boat. But the friend laughed and explained to his friend that the man had been long dead and that the man he claimed to know was the captain of the Titanic. Turns out the captain still remains at sea and likes to check up on the passing boats. Let's just hope he's not looking to be vengeful. Coming in at number 5, Lady in Black. Almost any haunted location has some kind of Lady in Black. I'm not sure exactly why, but it just happens to be part of the brand. And the Titanic Artifact Exhibition is no exception. Employees and guests alike all claim to have seen this mysterious woman. And it's said she wears a black period dress with a white collar and her hair in a bun. However, the most eerie of stories surrounding this ghost has to do with a photographer. Reportedly, he was getting ready for the opening of an exhibition when he spotted this woman casually walking down the grand staircase. He was understandably startled as he hadn't noticed anyone enter and the staircase was roped off, but he just assumed he must have missed her come in and that she was a part of the exhibit. So trying to be friendly, he asked if she'd like him to photograph her, but she ignored him. So he went back to setting up, but suddenly she was directly behind him. So again, he offered a photograph. But this time, she didn't just ignore him, she vanished right before his very eyes. It's believed she is a ghost of a woman who died on the ship, and while no one knows exactly who she might be, let's just hope she's not a dangerous spirit. Next up at number 4, a premonition. As the legend goes, on the very same night the ship went down, a young Scottish woman by the name of Jessie was on the verge of dying. It's said that in her delirious state, she supposedly spoke of a massive sinking ship and a man named Wally playing a fiddle, despite the fact that she would have no way of knowing the Titanic would sink that night. Unless she was placing some kind of curse, that is. I have to say the most insane part of the legend is that a man named Wallace, aka Wally Hartley, did indeed play his violin one last time as he and his band went down with the ship. Let's just hope some women on her deathbed wasn't the reason this all happened. Coming in at number 3, The Unlucky Mummy. One of the most well known alleged curses surrounding the Titanic is that of the unlucky mummy. Now, for a little context, approximately a thousand years before the time of Christ, a woman who has since been dubbed a priestess of the College of Amun Ra was born in the city of Thebes, Egypt. And it is believed this mummy is her embalmed body. Now, in terms of the unluckiness surrounding her mummy, in in the late 1890s, archaeologists discovered the burial site during a dig near Egypt's lost city of Luxor. According to legend, a rich Englishman arranged for the purchase of the mummy and her casket. However, as reported by the Museum of Unnatural History, the man inexplicably vanished before his purchase could be delivered. Then later, all three of his travel companions suffered misfortune. One of the men died, another was disabled in an accident, and the third suffered financial ruin. From that day forward, it was believed that anyone or anything that this mummy came into contact with would be cursed by misfortune, and rumors suggest that the mummy was eventually purchased by an American archaeologist who arranged for it to be transported to the United States aboard the Titanic. So for all we know, some ancient cursed mummy could have cursed the ship and sent it to its dark fate. Coming in at number 2, Missing Tourists. 
If there was ever an argument to be made for scary curses surrounding the Titanic, then this next story is probably the one I would pick. You may or may not have seen and heard the terrifying story that is unfolding as we speak, but essentially there was a tourist submarine that set out to tour the wreckage of the Titanic that has now been missing for over 48 hours. The missing vessel has five people on board, including British billionaire Hamish Harding, French diver Paul Henri Nargola, Pakistani entrepreneur Shadza Dawood with his son, and the final passenger is believed to be Stockton Rush, the founder of Ocean Gate Expeditions. The submarine dove down on Sunday morning, but after only an hour and 45 minutes into the tour, they lost all communication. Now, besides the obviously nerve wracking part of this all, what is really scary is that, according to Ocean Gate's website, the submarine can only last for up to 96 hours underwater with five people consuming oxygen. So the clock is ticking for the search and rescue team to try and track down the disappearing vessel before it's too late. It is truly a horrific and nightmare inducing situation, and many believe that the waters surrounding the haunted ship are to blame. And last up in our number one spot today is the wreck of the Titan. There are many conspiracy theories surrounding the Titanic, one being that it never actually set sail, another being that it deliberately sunk, but to be honest, none of them really hold much validity. However, there is one interesting conspiracy theory, and that is that a man named Morgan Robertson actually predicted and potentially even cursed the infamous ship when he published his novel The Wreck of the Titan in 1898, 14 years before the real life disaster. Now, to be clear, Robertson rejected any claims stating that he had something to do with the disaster, and insisted he was just drawing on his own real life experiences as a sailor. But I have to admit, some of the similarities between his story and the real life events are a little creepy. For example, even if you ignore that they had similar names, the fictitious Titan, like the Titanic, was supposed to be the largest of its kind and an unsinkable ship. Plus, it also lacked enough lifeboats to accommodate its passenger load, and struck an iceberg while going too fast in the North Atlantic. And as if that weren't strangely similar enough, both disasters took place in April and cost thousands of people their lives. So do you think this book was some kind of curse on the ship or just a really creepy coincidence? Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have The Vanishing Remains. It's been over 30 years since the Titanic wreck was found, and recently scientists have made another startling discovery. As it turns out, the remains of the wreckage don't have much time left. As we speak, they are currently vanishing. The ocean liner, which is over 100 years old, has not only been beaten by the currents of the deep sea, but the main culprit for its deterioration is an iron hungry bacteria that consumes hundreds of pounds of iron a day. This bacteria, which has been named Halomonas titanicae, is likely going to render the ship completely eroded by 2030. This means that researchers who want to discover more about the Titanic really are racing against time to get down there and see all that they can before the remains are gone, and the story of the Titanic remains just that. In our number 9 spot today we have portholes. Since the Titanic sunk, people have been trying to figure out exactly how this unsinkable ship sank and how it sank so quickly. A recent study may have found a previously undiscussed scenario that likely contributed to the speed of the sinking ship greatly. On that fateful day, of course, the Titanic grinded to a halt, and at that point the passengers had no idea why. This led to many of them opening up the portholes in the ship to get a look out in case they could see anything that would be stopping them from continuing on their journey. Many of those who opened the portholes didn't close them after, and with every open porthole that went underwater, it is estimated that it doubled the size of the damage to the ship. It is possible that these open windows may have caused the ship to sink at double the rate it would have had those windows been closed. Of course, this is not to blame the passengers, however, as this tragedy is certainly not their fault. In our number 8 spot today, we have the brittle fracture. This is another one of those theories behind how the Titanic found itself at the bottom of the North Atlantic. There was an expedition down to the wreckage of the Titanic recently, and it revealed something interesting about the hull of the ship. 
ship. There were these large pieces of steel that were recovered, each with about three rivet holes 1.25 inches in diameter. These pieces revealed that the hull's iron rivets failed to brittle fracture, which is the sudden and rapid snapping. This means that there was a failure in the structural materials, and this usually happens as a result of low temperature, high impact loading, and high sulfur content all three of which were present on the night of the tragedy. The water temperature was below freezing, the Titanic was traveling at a high speed upon impact with the iceberg, and the hull steel contained high levels of sulfur. These chunks of metal gave researchers one of the main answers as to why the Titanic sunk that night. In our number 7 spot today we have rich remains. When we think of the story of the Titanic we of course think of the sinking of the ship, we talk about how the survivors were saved, and then of course we think of the catastrophic loss of life. Many people don't stop to ask what happened with all of those who passed away in the tragedy however. More than 1,500 people passed away in the sinking of the Titanic and only 337 bodies were pulled from the water. A scholar named Jess Beer has recently examined what was done with those bodies, and throughout this recent Research, they have come to realize that whether or not these people got identified and what happened to the remains in the end all depended on their class and economic standing in life. About one third of the recovered bodies ended up being returned to the sea because rescuers didn't think that they would get any sort of life insurance payout from the families of those who had passed and who were of a lower economic standing. For any bodies to be preserved for land burial, the remains had to be easily identifiable and they needed to have a quote economic value even after death death with a high social or economic worth. In our number 6 spot today we have the unidentified passenger. Until about 10 years ago there were human remains that were recovered from the titanic sinking that were unidentified despite researchers best efforts. Initially there was one identity that they thought they could link the body to, but there were also 5 other identities on the table and no one was sure how to confirm who this person really was. A little over a decade ago however, using mitochondrial DNA testing, the re-examining of the DNA gave a 98 8.87% certainty the unknown person was in fact a passenger named Sidney Goodwin. A man named Ryan Parr is heavily credited with helping bring this mystery to a close, although he insists it couldn't have been done without the help of numerous researchers and scientists who also worked to reveal this passenger's true identity. In our number 5 spot today we have family ties. Lorraine Allison was just 2 years old when she boarded the Titanic with her family, her parents and her brother. At the time of the sinking it is said that Lorraine's brother was rushed to a lifeboat, but that the other three members of the family had passed in the tragedy. Despite this, only Lorraine's father's body was found, which led to the question of what happened to Lorraine and her mother. 28 years later, a woman named Helen Kramer came forward and said that she, in fact, was the missing Lorraine. Of course, people were skeptical and weren't willing to believe this, but until her death in 1992, Helen continued to claim that she was, in fact, Lorraine. After her passing, her granddaughter, Debrina Woods, resurfaced the claims by saying that she had inherited more evidence from her grandmother and that the truth should be told. Finally, a group of Titanic researchers with the power of modern science decided that they all wanted to solve this mystery once and for all. They did this by convincing descendants from each family to take a DNA test and once this was done, they were able to prove that there was no relationship between the two. They were finally able to put this long disputed claim to rest officially. In our number 4 spot today we have the telegraph. So you know how people often explain that perhaps many more people would have been saved from the titanic wreck if the nearby SS Californian had their telegraph operator awake when the distress call was sent? For the man who went to sleep, that's a heavy burden to bear for the rest of your life, but a recent study suggests that even if he was awake, there likely wouldn't have been anything that he could have done. Firstly, there wasn't any rule stating that this guy needed to be awake for 24 hours to man the telegraph machine, so right here, he is off the hook. This study however suggests that even if he was awake and the ship received the distress call, the ice around the titanic was so thick they likely wouldn't have been able to get through to save the passengers either way. Turns out that this disaster really just had the perfect recipe for tragedy. In our number 3 spot today we have the titanic radio. This is a piece of the ship that has not yet been recovered but it's the focus of much debate on whether or not it should be retrieved from the wreckage. Known in 1912 as the Marconi wireless telegraph machine, the radio on the Titanic sent distress calls to nearby ships that ended up saving the lives of 700 people in lifeboats. Despite how many people died in the Titanic tragedy, there were debates about whether or not to retrieve the artifact 
artifact because of the fact that there might still be remains located in the same area as the radio is. Lawyers have argued against the recovery of the radio because the dive plan did not include the prospect of there being human remains located down there. It also was argued because in order to retrieve it, they would need to cut into the ship's radio compartment, which was strongly opposed by preservation advocates. As of right now, it does appear as though the dive to retrieve the radio will still occur, but of course the pandemic delayed things quite a bit, so at this point it isn't exactly clear when. This radio would be a very valuable artifact, but it also would hold an eerie tale of exactly when and how the radio was used during the final moments of the Titanic. In our number two spot today, we have the inspection card. This inspection card once belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. What could possibly be worrisome about an inspection card? Well, it shows how Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card shows that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed, and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see that the word Majestic was crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. If only people were able to see what was about to strike and they could have warned her. If Marion's body was ever recovered, unfortunately, she has never been identified. In our number one spot today, we have the bell. The bell from the crow's nest of the Titanic was recovered from the wreckage and returned to land, where it now resides in the Titanic Museum. The eerie story behind this bell is that it would have been the one that was rung three times by the lookout Frederick Fleet in order to attempt to warn of the iceberg that was ahead. Frederick, as well as the other lookout who was with him, Reginald Lee, both ended up thankfully surviving the incident and went on to later explain what happened from their point of view. They explained that if they had been given binoculars to assist with their job, they could have seen the iceberg sooner. When asked how much sooner, Frederick replied, quote, well, enough to get out of the way. Coming up in our number 10 spot, we have the couldn't shower woman. This person on Reddit mentioned that throughout her whole life, she she has been obsessed with the Titanic, but in a way where she has always feared it. Her biggest fear was the Titanic for so long, not bugs or monsters under the bed. It was always the Titanic. She subsequently feared water because she would constantly have flashes of being on the Titanic when in water, and especially if it was cold. Her memories and thoughts were so vivid that she actually had a hard time showering and would have her sister sit in the bathroom with her until she was 17 years old. Whenever she would see pictures of sunken ships, and specifically when she saw pics of the Titanic, she would get anxious, even though sometimes she would seek them out. She doesn't have any specific memories, just flashes of staring up at the boat as it was sinking, and it has completely altered her life. That's wild. Imagine being so scared that you would literally need someone to be in the bathroom with you while you shower. She either was actually on the Titanic, or she really needs to speak to someone about her active imagination. That would be so terrifying to experience. In our number 9 spot we have The Water Is Coming. A woman's son that chose to remain nameless had an obsession with the Titanic. He was constantly talking about the Titanic and wanting to watch the movie and so one day she decided to take him to the Titanic exhibit. After going there he began to have night terrors and one night in particular she would never forget. She was watching TV when she heard loud banging in her son's room. She went inside to see him on all fours and heard him yell, go, 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 the water is coming. And then he let out a scream, but it wasn't his voice. It was the voice of an older man coming out of him. Apparently after that incident, her son started to talk about it less and she chalked it up to that maybe his soul had come to terms with the catastrophe and was more at peace. Hmm, wow. I definitely would have been extremely terrified if I had witnessed this. I wouldn't have been able to go back to sleep at least, that's for sure. In our number eight spot we have Michael Kushner. A TikToker and photographer by the name of Michael Kushner explained his Titanic story and how he has memories from the incident. In his explanation, he spoke about how around seven years old is when you start to lose your memories from a past life. And when he was seven, he saw the Titanic movie four times. And every time he saw the sinking scene, he felt that something wasn't right. Throughout his life, the Titanic followed him everywhere. When he moved to London, it was the 100 year 
year anniversary. And on the day he landed, a ship sunk and everyone was saying that it was just like the Titanic. The first playbill he ever photographed was called The Unsinkable Molly Brown. And even James Cameron, the director of the Titanic, said he didn't feel the sinking scene was depicted accurately and explained why. And Michael said that his explanation aligned with what he felt. Out of all of the stories that I'm going to tell you about today, this guy definitely feels like he could have been on the Titanic in another life. Would love to know your thoughts in the comment section below. In our number 7 spot, we have Paul Emerald. Paul Emerald is a Los Angeles producer that took part in a series of past life regressions for a television show he was working on. What he found though, led to a journey that he did not expect and he even wrote a book on it. He was convinced for so long that he wasn't going to live past the age of 25. And when he started doing these regressions, he realized that he had a lot of weird similarities with a passenger that died on the ship named John Jack Phillips, who was 25 when the boat sank. He decided to visit John's hometown and it was there that he experienced major deja vu, like he knew where everything was. So he did some more regressions and saw John's whole life. He is convinced that John was him in another life. Wow, that's an incredible story. Imagine just going to a random town and knowing where everything is because you were there in another life. In our number 6 spot we have the mysterious reddit user. This is told by a reddit user who explained that he always had a fascination with the titanic and an overwhelming amount of sadness and empathy around the situation. He explains that he's not a very empathetic person but for some reason he feels an increased amount of empathy for those that died on the ship. This user always freaks out when it comes to water and drowning is one of their biggest fears. They did a past life meditation to see if they could get a name, but only got a picture of being somewhere cold and icy. So interesting. I think it's possible that maybe there's a lot of people out there that didn't actually die on the Titanic, but they did die on like a shipwreck in a past life, and then maybe it would make sense why they would resonate with the Titanic, but who knows? In our number five spot, we have a love to remember. A 19 year old woman by the name of Amanda remembered being on the Titanic with her past love. She remembered being a first class passenger by the name of Julia, who met her man named Mark on board the ship. They both ended up taking a lifeboat together and surviving the disaster, and later on ended up getting married. Amanda said that she has a hard time finding love in her life nowadays because no one quite meets the standards of her previous love. Aww. Oh, that's sweet and terribly sad. Hopefully she ends up finding him again in this life. In our number 4 spot we have the claustrophobic man. This person is another reddit user that very much considers themselves to have died on the titanic in a past life and their justification? They hate being cold and can't swim well. Hmm. Interesting. He said, I'm deeply claustrophobic and so maybe I got trapped somehow, but all I know is that I've been deeply fascinated by the Titanic and the movie. Do you think it's possible that the movie casted some kind of spell on people around the world and because it felt so lifelike, people just felt as if they were there? Another user commented that they did lock passengers in the steerage, so it's possible this person was one of those passengers. Coming up in our number 3 spot, we have the girl with the green eye. This person believed they were on the Titanic because of a past life regression circle that they took part in. This person is a part of a pagan group and one day they were doing a past life regression exercise and she saw herself go down a long hallway with white walls and wood paneling and a plush red carpet and a fancy wooden door at the end of the hallway. Honestly this sounds like the final scene from the movie but I'm gonna go on. Anyway she goes into a room filled with water and a girl comes up to her with pure piercing green eyes and a blue lily crystal hairpin in her hair. Her eyes were filled with tears. They got into a lifeboat together but then the girl got out and continued to hold her hand. Once they lowered the boat, her hand slipped from the girl's hand as they were separated. Interesting. I swear something like that happens in the movie as well. I really wonder what people were saying before the movie came out and if their experiences were described similarly then. In our number 2 spot we have Alfred Peacock. A young young boy that was born two years after the sinking of the titanic would have tons of visions of being on the titanic growing up. He felt that he was on the titanic and couldn't imagine any other explanations for his visions. He remembered being a young boy on the titanic and that he lived in the third class.
class cabin with his family. He remembered that his name started with an A and ended with an E and a D, and that led him to think that his name was Alfred. After doing some research of the passengers that died on the ship, he came across an Alfred Peacock that was young on the ship and he believed that his memories were then confirmed. In our number one spot, we have Charles Latoller. A man remembers being a passenger on the Titanic that went by the name of Charles Latoller. Charles was a British sailor who was a second officer on board the Titanic. He did not die on the Titanic, he was one of the survivors and went on to live till the 50s. So this person must not be too old if he feels that he really was him in another life. He has flashes of walking down the staircase on the ship and seeing beautiful gowns. He always felt connected to the Titanic and after discovering a picture of Charles, he knew he felt a connection with it and he felt that it was himself. In June of 2001 when he was writing a book about the Titanic, a woman randomly came up to him in a coffee shop and told him that he was on the Titanic and opened up one of his research books of the Titanic and pointed to an officer and sure enough, she pointed to Charles Littoller. Freaky! Kicking off our list at number 10, first class passengers. While traveling in first class it might feel more comfortable at first, but when it came to the sinking of the Titanic, first class passengers had a better chance at survival. You would think obviously, but Here's why. Just over 200 first class passengers survived out of the 324 souls traveling in first class during that fateful voyage. That's a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people passed away, but in hindsight, a lot of people made it. If you've seen the James Cameron film, you know women and children were first to board these lifeboats. And then afterwards, it was first class men. See, by that point, there were few lifeboats left, which I'll get into, of course, later on. But second class and third class, their chances at survival here, right off the bat, were not great, simply because they were divided by class. Being stored further and lower from these lifeboats, the odds weren't in their favor. There were more than 700 third class passengers, and that number exceeded the other two classes combined. It's horrible. Those rooms were crammed. Four people would have to share one tiny room and the beds were smaller than twin beds. So when it comes to evacuating quickly, sadly these passengers had the hardest time getting out, which we don't often think of when we think of, you know, the Titanic and the sinking of it. Number nine, the band. We know how passionate musicians can be and we know that music can heal a lot of people, of course. While I'm absolutely sure there is nothing that could have been done to completely erase people's worries about what was about to happen on the Titanic that fateful night, the ship's orchestra did what they could, which was to play music. And I'm sure that it helped somebody in some way, shape or form. It wasn't just in the movie. Movie, right? The eight orchestra members continued to play as the ship sank in order to try and keep spirits up. First, it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that still would have been insanely brave of them too, but it turns out this is far from the truth. See, the band members were in fact not ship employees at the time, which means they technically had the same rights as any other passenger to leave and board a ship, but they chose not to. They all unfortunately passed away in the sinking of the ship and they played until they couldn't anymore, which I think is horribly sad but also very beautiful and heroic of them. The film can't quite capture the beauty. I'm sure that their heroism helped a lot of people who were also in this terrible situation, and I'm glad their acts have been remembered, even still. Number eight, locked doors. Ellen Hakarian was aboard the Titanic that fateful night, and Tanky Magazine actually published her survival story afterwards, titled, Going Down with the Titanic in Third Class. Yeah, I mentioned the first class differences between third class, so this story here is already a feat in itself. Ellen and her husband, Pecco, decided to leave Finland and start a new life in America. The night of April 14th, after the couple had returned to their cabin and got settled in, they heard a loud scraping sound, and the engines then started to act up. Pecco ran out to see what was going on. The hallway was tilted by the time Elin poked her head out moments later, once she heard a ruckus in the hallway. Then there was a knock at the door. One of her friends from Finland came in, and they said the ship was sinking, but Pecco was nowhere to be seen, and her friend asked, how did he get out of the passageway? All the doors are locked. I was confused. I didn't know what to do next. After a few moments, I grabbed my purse and life jacket and ran out to the passageway. The door was locked. All the doors were locked. A steward finally came along to guide the crew to third deck where they were then taken to the Carpathia and they didn't arrive to a safe ship until the sun was up the following day. So after losing her husband and all of her belongings, Ilan only received $125. That's all the ship could give them. They're like, we're sorry you lost everything. Here's the best we can do. 
That's it. Number seven, no binoculars. On that fateful night of the collision with the iceberg, binoculars were locked up the entire time. Now, of course, this could have changed literal history had they have been used, but why weren't they? The key to set lockup store in the binoculars was being held by Officer David Blair. Only before the Titanic's departure from Southampton, Officer Blair was pulled from the crew. Now, of course, this may not have made a difference at all, but it's important to note. To think that these were stashed in a locker in the crow's nest the entire time is haunting. Now, when you consider the history of it, the poor guy was trans transferred to another ship and he forgot a key. The amount of times I've forgotten a key or taken a work key home by accident, I mean, it's a simple mistake, but in this case, tragedy, really. Number six, ignored flares. Just 20 miles away from where the Titanic sunk, there was another boat. This one was called the SS Californian. This boat had stopped in order to avoid the ice, and the crew on the Titanic had also received warnings about icebergs. The Titanic had received six warnings about icebergs before the collision. Now, while the first few warnings were received by the captain, not all six were. Why so? The captain of this other boat, he slowed down and actually saw the emergency flares being set off on the Titanic ahead, but he ignored them because he thought that they were company rockets. The SOS signals that the Titanic was sending out weren't received until the next day because the radio operator on that SS Californian had gone to sleep. Yep, he took a little power nap after ignoring all the flares. By the time they had heard these calls and arrived the next day, it was obviously too late, sadly. Number five, less lifeboats. Before the Titanic even set sail during the preparation for the journey, at some point, people made a decision to reduce the number of lifeboats that were on board. Why they did this? Beats me, I don't know. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, which is truly trivial when we're talking about the safety of, I don't know, 2,208 passengers that were on board that day. The number of lifeboats ended up being reduced to just 20, with an additional four that were, you know, collapsible. So 24-ish lifeboats, 2,208 passengers. Doesn't add up, it's not, uh, it's a terrible ratio. Which means they should have had time to launch every single one, but this would still be only enough for half the passengers on board. It was cursed from the get-go. And as you may or may not know, during the sinking of the ship, not even all the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything happened too quickly, and it was chaos. There are quite a few lessons that can be definitely learned from the sinking of the Titanic, because the more we learn, the more we realize that safety precautions taken for these ships simply were just not up to par. It wasn't really about the iceberg. I mean, that did it, but there were other things that could have helped. Number four, the card. In the remnants of the Titanic, there was an inspection card found that belonged to a woman named Marianne Meanwell. This must seem like any ordinary find after a wreck, but it revealed a grim story for the woman. Once the card was found, it was then revealed that Marianne was not intended to be on the Titanic at all, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card shows us that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic, but for some reason, the trip she'd originally planned was delayed, and she instead was a signed to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see the word majestic was actually crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. It's, it's so haunting to look at now. There's no way anybody could have known or warned her. It's just a really tragic situation to look back on. And to physically see the cancellation of the ship gives me goosebumps. That's really horrible. Number three, Eliza Melvina Dean. This story really is something. Okay, buckle up. When thinking back to this tragedy, it's hard to imagine how it looked in real time, like being on the ship, right? I mean, you know, not from James Cameron's perspective, right? It was a moonless night in the pitch black. Of course, the navigation was hard. Of course, it could have been handled better, or they could have listened to the numerous warnings, but again, it was pitch black. This is what the iceberg looked like in real life. Eliza Dean was only a newborn on the Titanic. Her parents were on the way to the States with everything that they owned packed up in their luggage. See, Eliza's father was actually on the deck at the time of the collision, so he saw the ship hit that iceberg. How terrifying is that? But in doing so, he knew in that moment, get the family, hit the deck, something bad's gonna happen. Even as third-class passengers, they were thankfully some of the first on the lifeboats, which is incredible seeing as what I said earlier. It was Eliza, her brother, and her mother. They all got aboard safely, but her father Father, of course, never made it off, which is terrible, but his quick thinking saved his family. Number two, John Jacob Astor. As the ship was sinking, the first class passenger, John Jacob Astor, he put his young wife on one of the lifeboats and he was about to get in with her when he immediately saw two terrified children standing behind him. And it happened. He instead gave up his spot and let those other two children on the boat, which is just noble, it's brave, it's heroic. I, it's something that you ask yourself, could I do that? If it actually were to happen, would I have the willpower to do that? I hope so, this is absolute bravery. One of the 
Titanic survivors named Philip Mock saw John in one of his final moments later on after this brave moment. He saw him and his valet huddled together on one of the life rafts before they unfortunately froze in the cold water. It's tragic. This was indeed a very tragic event, but the positive news here is that both his wife and the child that she was carrying at the time were able to make it to safety and they survived the entire ordeal. While there are many terrible stories from this day, we also don't hear enough about the bravery that people showed during this tragic event. And finally, number one, Molly Brown. In total, there were 706 people who survived the sinking of the Titanic. Molly Brown has been referred to as the unsinkable Molly Brown. And when you look into her story, it really checks out. Margaret Brown not only survived the Titanic, which is just an incredible feat in itself, and it's the odds there are just incredible, but once aboard the life ship, she threatened the quartermaster. She said she'll throw him overboard if he didn't go back immediately and start looking for more survivors. That's bad. That, that is something I will do. I hope I can do in a moment like this. That's incredible. Historically, this is where the accounts get a little hazy. See, it's not confirmed whether the boat actually went back to look, but after narrowingly surviving a tragedy, then you're barely conscious. You still think of other people? That's the, that's the moral of the story here. Margaret was traveling in Egypt, but when a grandchild got sick, she ended her trip early just to go back to the States and take care of them. Once she got all this attention after surviving said disaster, she then campaigned publicly for women's rights and education for the poor. She was a badass in the boat and then a badass afterwards. Like, this is insane. There was a musical comedy in the 60s called The Unsinkable Molly Brown. So her name will be remembered for a while. As it should be. Thank you, Molly. Kicking off list at number 10, first class. While traveling in first class may feel more comfortable when it came to the sinking of the Titanic, first class passengers had a better chance at survival. Just over 200 first class passengers survived out of the 324 souls traveling in first class during that fateful voyage. If you've seen the James Cameron film, you know women and children were first to board these lifeboats, and then it was first class men. By that point, there were a few lifeboats left, which I'll get into later on, that's a whole thing. But second Second class and third class, their chances at survival were not great. Being stored further and lower away from these light boats, it took longer to get there, especially with the rush and the crowds too. It was chaos. There were more than 700 third class passengers, that number exceeded the other two classes combined. And those rooms were horrible, they were crammed. Four people would have to share one tiny room and each of the beds were smaller than twin beds. So when it comes to evacuating quickly, sadly these passengers had the hardest time getting out. Number nine, locked doors. Ellen Hakarian was aboard the Titanic April 15th, 1912, and back in September 1987, Tanky Magazine published her survival story. It was titled, Going Down with the Titanic in Third Class. Ellen and her husband, Pekko, decided to leave Finland and start a new life in America. The night of April 14th, after the couple had returned to their cabin and got settled in, they heard a loud scraping sound and the engines started to act up a bit. Pekko left the room to go and see what was going on. The hallway was tilted by the time Ellen poked her head out moments later, once she heard a ruckus in the hallway. There was then a knock at the door, one of her friends from Finland came, and they said the ship was sinking, but Pekko was nowhere to be seen at this point. He was still gone. Her friend asked, how did he get out of the passageway in the first place because all the doors are now locked. I was confused. I didn't know what to do next and after a few moments I grabbed my purse and life jacket and ran out to the passageway. The door was locked. All the doors were locked. A steward finally came along to guide the crew to the third deck where they were taken to the Carpathia. They didn't arrive to a safe ship until the sun was up the next morning. And after losing her husband and all of her belongings, Aileen received $125. That's horrible. After that entire night they're like, here's some money. That would be around four grand now, which is not enough to fix anything. Number eight, record time. It's been noted by many survivors that the Titanic was traveling quite fast, faster than anything they've experienced before. Well, that's because the ship's captain, Edward J. Smith, was trying to beat the crossing time of the Titanic's older White Star sibling. Now, there were already concerns about icebergs at this point, but the fact that the captain still went ahead at full speed, regardless of all the oncoming icebergs, well, sure didn't help. Astronomers at Texas State University at San Marcos discovered something cosmic that may have had something to do with the sinking of the Titanic that night. The alignment of the sun, the moon, and us on Earth could have created higher than normal tides in the Atlantic Ocean around January 1912. So by the time the Titanic was whipping through months later, icebergs that used to be stuck in the Labrador Sea could have gotten in the way. It also would have helped to see the iceberg approaching from afar, but number seven, no binoculars. On the night of the collision, binoculars were locked up the entire time. Of course, this could have possibly changed history, so why weren't they used? Where were they? Well, the key to the lockup was being held by Officer David Blair. Only before the Titanic's departure from Southampton, Officer Blair was pulled from the crew. Of course, this may not have made a difference at all, you know, with all things considered, but it's important to note. 
To think these were stashed in a locker in the crow's nest this entire time is actually pretty haunting. Poor guy was transferred to another ship and forgot to give the key back. The amount of times I've taken a work key home with me, honestly, it's a simple mistake. So this is tragic. Number six, wrong turn. It's the middle of the night. There aren't any binoculars at disposal. It's high tides. It's hard to see. But did the steersman accidentally point the Titanic towards the iceberg? Well, back in 2010, Louise Patton said this story was passed down from her grandfather, who just happened to be the most senior ship officer that survived that disaster. Apparently what happened was the iceberg was seen, and of course there was little time given the speed of the ship at that point, so command immediately issued to turn hard a starboard. That command was passed down a line like broken telephone. It was screamed past multiple people, so eventually the command was received as make the ship turn right, rather than push the tiller to the right, which would have made the ship go left. It's confusing, and also at that moment, it's hard to hear. There's no chance, this is anyone's fault. Number five, not enough lifeboats. Before the Titanic set sail, at some point, a decision was made to reduce the number of lifeboats on board. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, and, and looking back now, it's honestly haunting to think that was once a thought, like that mattered at all. They just ruined the aesthetic, like, okay, sure. The safety of 2,208 passengers aboard, we could use some more boats. The number of lifeboats ended up being reduced to just 20 with an additional four that were collapsible. 24 lifeboats, that's it. This meant that should they even have time to launch every single boat, this would only still be enough for half the passengers on board. Only half. And that's if it worked perfectly at that point. Even when the Titanic was going down, none of the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything unfolded quickly. Number four, staying warm. The Titanic was obviously quite fancy. Its dining selections were fancy, the wines were fancy, it was all fancy, but alcohol was sadly reserved only for first class. The bar had 1,500 bottles of wine and 20,000 bottles of beer. Most of the people who passed away that night, it was because of icy temperatures in the water. I mentioned the alcohol in the cold water because one passenger named Charles Jogan, Charles was the baker on the ship, and when he realized the fate of the ship, it was probably going down, he drank everything he could see. He just chugged as much as he can. Honestly, I'm on board with drinking responsibly and all that, but if this was the case, yeah, of course, go for it. You don't want to be sober when this is happening. Charles was found two hours after the ship had completely gone down, somehow still treading water, and also somehow alive, and also extremely drunk. What happened here was the alcohol, the rather large amount of alcohol, slowed his heat loss, so he was able to hold on until help arrived, luckily. Number three, a helping hand. John Astor was one of the first class passengers on the ship that night. Now as the ship was sinking, he put his wife on one of the lifeboats, but as he was about to get in himself with her, he saw two children standing behind him. Of course, they were petrified. So John, John Astor, he gave up his spot and let those two children take his instead. One of the Titanic survivors named Philip Mock later saw John and his valet huddled together on one of the life rafts trying to keep each other warm, but they both sadly didn't make it. A sad story of course, but John's wife and the child that she was carrying at the time both survived and made it to safety. Number two, an alternate trip. Not much was found of the Titanic afterwards. The pressure of the ocean, all those many secrets are truly lost to history. But there was an inspection card found. It belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. Now this may seem like a mundane find at first, but it revealed a grim story for the woman. Once the card was found, it was revealed that Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic that night, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of those passengers. The card shows that originally she was supposed to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic, but due to a coal strike, the Majestic voyage was delayed and she instead was then assigned to the Titanic. On Marion's card, you can see Majestic crossed out and the new trip says Titanic. It's grim, it's very heartbreaking. And finally, number one, ignored flares. Barely 20 miles away from where the Titanic sunk, there was another boat. This one was called the SS Californian. This boat had stopped in order to avoid the ice. The crew on the Titanic had also received warnings about the icebergs. The Titanic had actually received about six warnings before the collision. Only the first few were received by the captain. Now the captain of this other boat slowed down and actually saw the emergency flares being set off on the Titanic ahead, but he ignored them because he thought they were company rockets. And the SOS signals that the Titanic sent out as well weren't received until the next day because the radio operator on that SS Californian had gone to sleep. By the time they heard these calls and arrived the next day, it was of course too late. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the heads up. I'm not sure why, but for actual years, I thought that on the day of the Titanic sinking, the iceberg they hit just kind of came out of nowhere and surprised them. So imagine my surprise when I found out that wasn't true even in the slightest. 
It turns out the entire thing could have been avoided. The crew had received six warnings about the iceberg before the collision. While the first few warnings were received by the captain, not all of them were, and it's not totally clear why. Although the crew knew about the icy conditions on the water, they didn't slow down much, which some have called a reckless decision, but apparently this was standard practice at the time, so I suppose you can't really blame them. The final warning, however, was received from a ship that had halted for the night due to an ice field a few miles away, and when the message was being relayed to the captain, he cut it off and said to shut up as he was working Cape Race. In our number 9 spot today we have the futility. This is more so something that happened prior to the fateful day of the Titanic sinking, but it's still quite unsettling and also kind of bizarre nonetheless. In 1898 a book called Futility was released by an author named Morgan Robertson. This book tells the story of a large ship named the Titan. The Titan sets out for its first sail but encounters and strikes an iceberg. This certainly sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? Considering this book was released in 1898 and the real life event of the Titanic sinking happened in 1912, there are many people who believe that this novel predicted this fateful day. It's most likely a very strange coincidence, but man is it really weird. Even with the names being so close, let alone how the rest of the story just matches up so well. Maybe Morgan Robertson is a time traveler or some kind of prophet, but if he was to guess it would be kind of rude to just write a book about it rather other than, I don't know, warn someone? In our number 8 spot today we have True Love. Two of the first class passengers who were on the ship were elderly couple Isidore and Ida Stratus. When the ships started to sink and lifeboats were being boarded, attendants were ushering Ida into one of the lifeboats, but of course without her husband since women and children were being rescued first. Ida however refused to leave her husband and Isidore refused to be rescued before other men. Instead they both chose to stay on the ship and they went down together. Ida said quote, I will not be separated from my husband. As we have lived, so we will die together. Survivors who witnessed their love last saw the pair standing on the deck with their arms around each other. This love story is incredibly tragic, but also just such a testament to how much they loved each other. I am very glad that they had one another in those very frightening moments. In our number 7 spot today we have Take My Spot. John Jacob Astor was one of the first class passengers on the ship that day. As the ship was sinking, he put his young wife on one of the lifeboats and he was about to get in with her when he saw two absolutely terrified children standing behind behind him. He instead gave up his spot and let those two children on the boat, which is both noble but it's also just the right thing to do. One of the Titanic survivors named Philip Mock saw John in one of his final moments. He saw him and his valet huddled together on one of the life rafts before they unfortunately froze in the cold water. This was indeed a very tragic event but the positive news is that both his wife and the child she was carrying at the time were able to make it to safety and survive the whole ordeal, which also likely means that the children he gave gave his spot up for also survived. While there are many terrible stories from this day, we also hear quite a few about the bravery people showed during this tragic event. In our number 6 spot today we have the lifeboat. Before the Titanic set sail during the preparation for the journey, at some point people made a decision to reduce the number of lifeboats that were on board. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, which is truly trivial when we are talking about the safety of the 2,208 passengers that were on board that day. The number of lifeboats ended up being reduced to just 20 with an additional 4 that were collapsible. This meant that, should they have had time to launch every single one, this would still only be enough for half of the passengers on board. That's a terrible ratio. And as you may or may not know, during the sinking of the ship, not even all of the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything happened too quickly. There are quite a few lessons that can be and definitely were learned from the sinking of the Titanic, because the more we learn, the more we realize that the safety precautions taken for the ship simply were just not up to par. In our number 5 spot today we have the card. In the remnants of the Titanic there was an inspection card found that belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. This may seem like a mundane find, but it revealed a very grim story for the woman. Once the card was found, it was revealed that Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic that day, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card showed that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. 
For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see that the word Majestic was crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. There clearly is no way anyone could have known or warned her. It's just a really tragic situation all around. In our number four spot today, we have slow action. While we were just talking about lifeboats, I mentioned how there wasn't enough time to launch all of the ones on board. This is true, and while the Titanic sank fairly quickly, there would have been more time if only people were more prepared. What I mean is that from the point where the ship actually hit the iceberg until the first lifeboats were launched was an entire hour. That is way too long when it is an emergency of this magnitude, which obviously leaves us wondering why. Well, as it turns out, a lot of people thought that the alarm bells were actually just a drill and they stayed inside where it was warm. This is already terrible, but what's even worse is that for the people who didn't think it was a drill, they had absolutely no idea where to go or what to do in the case of an emergency. They had never done any lifeboat drills so everyone was just panicking with nowhere to go. Due to this lifeboat delay, there wasn't enough time to launch all of the remaining lifeboats successfully. This means that there are likely many lives that could have been saved had they had some more direction or prior training. In our number three spot today, we have ignored help. Only 20 miles away from the location of the sinking of the Titanic was another boat called the SS Californian. This boat had stopped in order to avoid the ice, which was clearly a fantastic idea. What is pretty insane, however, is that the captain of this boat actually saw the emergency flares being set off on the Titanic, but he ignored them because he figured they were company rockets. And to make this matter even worse, the SOS signals that the Titanic was sending out weren't even received until the next day because the radio operator on the SS Californian had gone to sleep. By the time they heard these calls and arrived the next day, everyone had unfortunately already passed away and they weren't able to save anyone. Who knows what could have happened had they taken those emergency signals seriously? It's obviously not their fault, but it definitely makes you think. In our number two spot today, we have the band. We know how passionate musicians can be, and we know how healing music is for a lot of people. While I am absolutely sure that there was nothing that could be done to completely erase people's worries about what was going on, the ship's orchestra did what they could, which was to play music. The eight orchestra members continued to play as the ship sank in order to try and keep spirits up, I'm sure for other passengers as well as themselves. At first, it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that would still have been insanely brave of them, but as it turns out, this is far from true. The band members were in fact not ship employees, which means that they had the same rights as any passenger to leave, but they chose not to. They all unfortunately passed away in the sinking of the ship and they played until they couldn't anymore, which I think is horribly sad, but also very beautiful and heroic of them. I'm sure that their heroism helped a lot of people who were also in this terrible situation, and I'm glad that their acts have been remembered even still. In our number one spot today, we have Wrong Turn. Okay, so we talked about how many warnings about the iceberg were ignored, but what happened when people finally stopped ignoring them? Well, once the iceberg was actually spotted, the chief officer received this warning and he ordered the helmsman to turn the wheel. Apparently this was actually a huge mistake, but it's unlikely they would have known that at the time. Researchers now believe that if they hadn't turned the wheel, the ship might not have sunk. The ship itself had bulkheads in the bow, so it is very likely that had the ship collided head on with the iceberg, it actually would have been fine. They said that a head on collision would have either stopped the ship from sinking at all, or it would have at least sunk a lot more slowly, which would have given more time for people to be rescued. It's easy for us to look back and say this would have been the best move, but under that kind of pressure, it's tough to see things as clearly as we can right now. In our number 10 spot today, we have musical instruments. Two parts of a destroyed clarinet, as well as a violin that was played by bandmaster Wallace Hartley, were found among the wreckage of the Titanic. I know musical instruments instruments aren't exactly a terrifying discovery, but the discovery reminds us of the heartbreaking story of the Titanic's band. As the Titanic sank, it is famously known that the band played on despite the absolutely horrific incident that was taking place around them. At first, it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that still would have been insanely brave of them. But as it turns out, this is far from true. The band members were in fact not ship employees, which means that they had the same rights as any passenger 
passengers to leave. So why didn't they? Well, it is now widely believed that it most likely was so that they could use their music to help calm people so that they wouldn't panic. That's some major bravery right there. In our number 9 spot today we have a men's shoe. This artifact is one of the rarest to be shown of the items that have been recovered from the titanic wreckage because of the fact that it is in such poor condition. All that remains of the shoe are the welt, top cap, and just a touch of the insole. This artifact does a couple things. It reminds you of the very real humans who became victims of this tragedy, and it also reminds you of the unrelenting nature of the ocean. Seeing the personal belongings of the passengers, regardless of knowing who specifically the shoe belonged to in their story, just adds a personal element. Like you almost knew them. And then seeing how torn up the shoe has become is a strong reminder to us all that we truly are no match for Mother Nature, and the ocean is one of the most powerful and frightening things on the earth. In our number 8 spot today we have a love letter. Richard Geddes was a cabin attendant on the Titanic who wrote a love letter to his wife while aboard, but unfortunately she would never go on to receive it. The letter was written on the original Titanic stationery, and it even had its original white star line envelope when it was found. While this story in itself is of course extremely sad, and again one of those reminders of the human side of those who were in this incident, this letter also contained something else beside utterings and confessions of love. It also featured a description that Richard wrote for his wife of a near collision that the Titanic had with the SS City of New York, obviously prior to the terrible iceberg incident. There were people who had witnessed this near collision and believed that it was a bad omen for the Titanic. In our number 7 spot today we have a pocket watch. Okay, this artifact most certainly isn't the scariest one on today's list, but the story behind who it belonged to is one for the books. Sinai Cantor was 34 years old when he was a passenger on the Titanic. On board with him was his wife Miriam, and the pair were from Russia. They purchased second class passenger tickets, which at the time cost them 26 pounds, which is about $3,666 in today's money. When tragedy struck and the Titanic was sinking, Sinai immediately thought of his wife. He was able to get her aboard one of the life rafts thankfully, and as far as I know, she was rescued from the icy waters. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for him, however, as he ended up being one of those who passed away in the sinking of the ship. During rescue efforts, this pocket watch ended up being recovered from his body. In our number 6 spot today we have the inspection card. This inspection card once belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. What could possibly be worrisome about an inspection card? Well, it shows how Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card shows that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed, and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see that the word Majestic was crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. If only people were able to see what was about to strike and could have warned her. In our number 5 spot today we have the Titanic radio. Okay. Don't yell at me. This is a piece of the ship that has not yet been recovered, but it's the focus of much debate on whether or not it should be retrieved from the wreckage. Known in 1912 as the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Machine, the radio on the Titanic sent distress calls to nearby ships that ended up saving the lives of 700 people in lifeboats. Despite how many people died in the Titanic tragedy, many of their bodies have never been recovered, which is why there were debates about whether or not to retrieve the artifact because of the fact that there might still be remains located in the same area as the radio is. Lawyers have argued against the recovery of the radio because the dive plan did not include the prospect of there being human remains located down there. It also was argued because in order to retrieve it, they would need to cut into the ship's radio compartment, which was strongly opposed by preservation advocates. As of right now, it appears as though the dive to retrieve the radio will still occur, but it isn't exactly clear when. This radio would be a very valuable artifact, but it also would hold an eerie tale of exactly when and how the radio was used during the final moments of the Titanic. In our number 4 spot today we have the telegraph. Separate from the radio we just talked about, the ship's telegraph machine was recovered in 1987 and this was used to relay commands to the engine room. So it was used as a communication device on board rather than to communicate with other ships. This telegraph machine is likely the one that was used to communicate to turn away from the iceberg in the North Atlantic Ocean. Unfortunately these commands came way too late 
as the ship struck the iceberg only 37 seconds after it was finally seen, and we all know what happened next. This telegraph was actually part of a Titanic auction that featured over 5,000 recovered artifacts that were selling for a combined some $200 million. In our number three spot today, we have the bell. The bell from the crow's nest of the Titanic was recovered from the wreckage and returned to land where it now resides in the Titanic Museum. The eerie story behind this bell is that it would have been the one that was rung three times by the lookout, Frederick Fleet, in order to attempt to warn of the iceberg that was ahead. Frederick, as well as the other lookout who was with him, Reginald Lee, both ended up thankfully surviving the incident and went on to later explain what happened from their point of view. They explained that if they had been given binoculars to assist with their job, they could have seen the iceberg sooner. When asked how much sooner, Frederick replied, well, enough to get out of the way. In our number two spot today, we have the big piece. This was a 15 ton section of the Titanic that ended up being recovered from the ocean floor. The wreckage of the Titanic was not found until 1985 when oceanographer Robert Ballard was doing a secret underwater expedition. The big piece is about 26 by 12 feet and it was once a section of the ship's starboard side hull. This piece also has a part of the original support beam that attached this piece to the frame of the ship. It is said that where this piece was located on the ship, basically everything else around it was absolutely obliterated when the ship split in two. This artifact is said to be the reminder of the most violent aspect of the sinking of the ship, which is a horrifying thought. It was found among many other smaller pieces of the ship that had all been broken up. In our number one spot today, we have this cherub statue. In the remnants of the Titanic, they recovered a broken cherub statue that once found its home on the grand staircase of the Titanic. Aside from cherubs just being kind of creepy in general, there's something exceptionally eerie about this piece of religious iconography being at the center of such a huge disaster, as well as being found among the wreckage years later. Cherubs are usually known as bearers of the throne or creatures who attend to God, so it's just a little creepy to have one at the scene of a terrible disaster, as well as it making through all of the years and years that the Titanic was underwater waiting to be found. Thank you.